Great. Thank you so much. At this time, I will call up, I believe Mr. Sudi is there. And uh, so go ahead. The floor is yours, Mr. Sudi. Nice to see you. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council, City Manager, uh, Brian Sudi, Deputy City Attorney, for the record. Uh, we are, well, we're presenting today on, on obviously the WIP ordinance and before we get into the actual draft of the ordinance, I think it's best to actually hear from the Reno Police Department the, the issues that they have encountered with these WIPs and I think the best person to do this is standing next to me today is Lieutenant Ryan Conley. He is the boots on the ground. He is the one who is encountering both the people who are using WIPs as, long, as well as the citizens who are, are making complaints. And I'm going to turn it over to him to begin the presentation and both of us will um, be available for questions. All right, thank you. Great to have you, Mr. Conley, from our incredible Reno Police Department. Thank you, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, Council Members for allowing uh, us to present here today. Uh, Lieutenant Ryan Conley with the Reno Police Department for the record. Um, I am the uh, supervisor over the community action and outreach um, unit of the Reno Police Department. Um, I'd like to start um, by reading into uh, the record a uh, Reno direct complaint that um, has been sitting in my, uh, my file here related to the RIP ordinances. Just to kind of give you a uh, perception of the citizens, I know you've heard um, some public comment already um, and I'll tell you my perception, but this comes from a uh, a citizen um, who contacted Reno Direct uh, November of last year. Um, she complains of several things, one of them including, and I'll read it, uh, people come down here cracking homemade whips and store-bought ones just so they can hear how loud it is between the buildings and in the parking lot of the 7-Eleven and laundromat. There are days they start in the morning, then some in the afternoon, but it's late at night and very early morning ones that are the worst. I've seen at least five different guys so far with different types of whips, so I have no clue if they have formed a club or what. I suffer from PTSD, and the cracking of the whips is one of my childhood traumas, and so the noise is very hard for me to handle. She goes on to say, I wish I had the money to move out of this place. I know I am not able physically or nor mentally to do anything anymore. I just wish the, Re the city of Reno would do something. And that is from uh, Debbie Wall, who lives at 48 South Park Street. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, uh, like Brian was saying uh, today, uh, the proposed ordinance is uh, unlawful use of a whip. Um, the popularity of possessing a whip and cracking has grown significantly over the last few years, as you've heard several uh, citizens say. Um, calls for service regarding the whips have nearly doubled in the last year. Um, the call for service data that we have um, comes from our, our dispatch and they did an incredible job of combing through the various calls related to whips and finding ones that specifically either an officer responded and confirmed it was a whip or a citizen uh, made the observation or an officer was in the area and was able to confirm it was a whip. Um, the vast majority of, these, of the whips that we have seen um, in and around town are homemade. Um, they use a variety of materials such as rope, string, chains, uh, leather, um, to name a few. The average length we have seen, uh, 7 and 15 feet, though that obviously varies based off materials that they uh, were able to gather. Uh, the persons possessing the whips have used them in fights for intimidation and to practice cracking the whip. Uh, the cracking of the whip, just uh, for everyone's knowledge, occurs when the tip breaks the speed of sound. Um, and as you've heard from several citizens, it is reported oftentimes as a shots fired call. Uh, the individuals we have contact with these types of whips are amateurs um, when it comes to their proper use. Um, it's evident that they don't possess it for its intended proper use, such as um, farm work or uh, entertainment value. These are a couple of examples um, that we've um, seen in the field. As you can see, uh, rudimentary homemade, um, made out of rope, duct tape, chains. Uh, here's a couple of videos, if we could play those. So as you can see there on the left, it's kind of hard to see, but that's actually the rear of a Reno Police Smart unit um, parked about 10 feet away from them. So um, our presence alone is obviously no deterrent. Uh, 
And next video. Um, as you can see, that second video was taken um, downtown in the middle of one of our, our parks, um, broad daylight. Uh, to the uninitiated, to the layman, um, those, you can see how easy those would be confused with, uh, with gunshots. Um, so these are just some uh, stats, stats that we were able to draw. Uh, from January to September 2019, we had a 63 total calls for service. Um, and these, like I said, these calls for service were from dispatch actually going back, looking at shots fired calls individually, um, hand mucking these calls for service and identifying those that were um, WIP related. 35% of those were entered as priority one or two, a majority in the central district. And you can see that the numbers are growing. In, in January, September of 2020, uh, 103 total and 60% entered as priority one or two, and then September to um, 2020 to Jan, excuse me, July of this year, we've had 176 total, 31% entered as priority one or two. And I draw your attention to the uh, percentage of priority one and two calls there. Um, those necessitate priority ones, a uh, double officer uh, response. So those would be the highest priority calls. They supersede uh, any call officers will secure from lower priority calls, from uh, property crimes, residential burglaries, that kind of thing, to respond to a priority one. Um, priority twos are, are a little bit less um, of a priority, but they also preempt officers from responding to uh, stolen vehicles, vehicle burglaries, petty larcenies, that kind of thing. Um, they also uh, necessitate the two officer response uh, because oftentimes they do come in as shots fired calls. Um, unless we have an officer in the area or somebody uh, in the area to actually positively identify the, uh, the whip as such, then it is usually entered in as a uh, shots fired call just due to the nature of the, uh, the sound. Um, so like I said, uh, this ordinance is important to us, uh, important to public safety um, because it takes away um, officers, um, takes away their time that's uh, valuable that could be out there helping uh, other citizens in need um, as well as our emergency dispatch. Um, causes concern to the citizens who call 911 uh, reporting these shots fired calls. Um, it also impacts our um, gun initiative against uh, gun violence. Um, when our detectives attempt to do follow-up on the shots fired calls that are legitimate um, shootings, they have to sift through these calls, find out which ones are uh, not related to an actual gunfire. Um, sometimes they may respond to a park where the night before we had multiple shots fired calls and it turns out that those were only whips um, so that ties up their time from conducting the follow-up that's needed for the actual um, gun violence follow-ups that they're doing. Uh, the tip of the whip obviously breaks the sound barrier if used correctly. Uh, the integrity of the whip is compromised due to not being professionally constructed uh, and the materials that they are made out of. Uh, most individuals, as you've seen in these videos, are practicing them in public spaces, such as city sidewalks, parks, and uh, many citizens have reported frustration that uh, Reno PD cannot make these individuals stop using the whip in such public spaces. Um, the uh, comment was made uh, about disturbing the peace. Um, obviously, disturbing the peace is a misdemeanor occurring. If it doesn't occur within an officer's presence, they need a citizen to, to be the complainant. Uh, you can imagine how difficult that would be in the middle of the night if somebody is at the montage and they're hearing this, being able to um, specify where the suspect is, describe the suspect, actually see them cracking the whip uh, in the middle of the day or in the middle of the night. So um, we haven't had much luck, um, if at all, with applying um, existing ordinances to this uh, problem. 
I want to draw Council's uh, attention to one case. <coughs> Excuse me. It occurred uh, June 15th of this year. Uh, we responded to a Citizens Hill right outside uh, City Hall here at the City Plaza. A uh, citizen had, was enjoying the uh, plaza when he was involved in an altercation with a uh, female skateboarder. She ended up uh, hitting him in the face um, with the skateboard as he was walking around the plaza looking for an ambassador to uh, get some assistance in contacting 911. Uh, he was uh, approached by the suspect who uh, uh, attacked him, punched him in the face. Uh, the suspect then took out a whip and began whipping the uh, victim in the face. Um, the victim was able to get control of the whip after being hit, uh, at which time the suspect produced a, a handgun and pointed it at the, uh, the victim. He was able to flee the area and contact us. The suspect was later arrested for the battery, um, battery with the deadly weapon and assault with the deadly weapon. So uh, you can see that it wasn't just um, a, a hobby for this, this suspect here. He was actually using it um, as a threat uh, in an aggressive manner. So. Uh, and finally, downtown Reno and city parks are places uh, we want to encourage citizens to visit. Uh, we want them to feel safe there. Currently, uh, we don't have any laws that can be enforced regulating the use and possession of this whip uh, unless someone's injured, and then we would have uh, you know, the, the battery charge on that. Uh, but we'd like to get it handled before it becomes uh, a battery issue. Uh, this pur proposed ordinance will assist in keeping uh, these areas safe and will significantly reduce these types of calls for service, which will allow our officers to uh, focus their, their efforts elsewhere, um, elsewhere in the community where they're needed. And I'll turn it over to uh, Brian Sudi to discuss the uh, legal aspects. So when I was tasked with the... Uh, the Madam Mayor? Yes. You know, we're very tight on our rules for uh, question and answer under our rules and if you bring two staff members up and we don't get questions you know we don't get adequate time and so since this is a collaboration between two departments um, and I I don't want myself and others to lose the opportunity because this is kind of a new initiative um, could we have a chance to question the lieutenant first sure. any questions sure. that we might have okay sure. and I'll yield to, uh, I'll yield to others who might have questions yeah, that's the only thing that I want to make sure sometimes it, we can be out of balance. Um, so I want to make sure everyone gets the opportunity to ask the questions they want. So it's just not one council member monopolizing time. That's the reason why I try to um, be respectful and rotate. So it's not personal. It's just I want to make sure everyone gets their own questions in. So, okay. With that being said, any, anything else, um, Officer Conley, that you want to add? Uh, one thing I would like to mention, um, if council does uh, deem it necessary or appropriate to move forward with this, um, the Reno PD will obviously, since uh, uh, Councilwoman Breck has pointed out, is a new initiative, um, have that um, education peers or period um, prior to enforcement action. Um, typically with something new like this, we usually do about two weeks of just education, um, advising the, the citizens. Um, and I've also been in contact with Judge Hazlitt Stevens, who runs the community court. Um, and he has already agreed to accept, um, if this ordinance is approved, accept these uh, violations into community court, um, along with all the other offenses that he, uh, he oversees. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Officer Conley. You did a great job. Um, I, I haven't seen you before at council, but I just wanted to say um, good job and thank you so much for your information for coming today. Okay, that being said, I'm going to open it up to questions for Officer Conley and for uh, Mr. Sudi. So at this time, I, I can't see any other council members up, but I think it's Councilman Breckis. Go ahead. Um, you know what, I think Ms. Stewart and Mr. Reese have questions, so I'll defer to them and, and then um, I'd like a chance after them. Okay, go, go ahead, Councilwoman Dewar. Okay, um, first of all, I just want to say that I'm glad that we are proceeding with this. Um, this has been a long time coming. I too have heard the issues that the police have difficulty using our existing ordinances to address the issues that have uh, arisen due to the cracking of whips. I myself have experienced it. Um, I have a few questions. One of them is 
I'd like to draw an analogy to guns. So we have artistic guns that can be displayed in cases. They're not typically used for shooting. And I just want to, you know, try to understand this in the context of other things that could be used for weapons. For example, a knife. Um, people, I believe, I've, I've encountered people walking in the streets with sabers or knives or, or swinging them around. And my understanding is if they're secured, that's one thing. But if they're waving them around, that's a whole different thing. And I've had to actually um, engage our police officers in some cases like that involving knives. And so to me, um, I don't have a problem with possession of whips, but I do have a problem with them being used on our streets. Um, beyond that, I also am concerned about them on non-city owned property. An example would be property owned by the Truckee River Flood Project. So I think it should not, if we do move forward with an ordinance, I think we should more broadly interpret it. I mean, just as you can't use a something that could be used as a weapon in a threatening manner on private property, let's say a knife, um, I don't think you should be able to use a whip in a threatening manner on private property either. Um, again, I don't have a problem with people owning them, making them, displaying them, but I do have a problem with them being used in public places. Um, one, also, there was a comment that these are used to relieve stress and tension. And I, I can think of so many ways that people could relieve stress and tension, whether it's sleeping, walking, meditating, yoga. There are many, many things that people can do that do not interfere with other people's public enjoyment of the air, the space, the property, uh, the quiet, the peaceful enjoyment of our parks. So I want to make sure uh, to the points that were made about um, freedom of expression that people are allowed to own display, um, even potentially practice if we want to set up areas where they can practice. But I, I think it's very inappropriate. We would not accept people, let's say, throwing knives at a tree to practice their knife flowing skills in the middle of our park. They might miss. <laughs> so um, I have a number of questions, but I see my time is out and I'll wait for a second round. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Councilman Reese. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think for my purposes, I want to address my comments primarily to a concern raised broadly in the community about what happens when we criminalize petty offenses, so misdemeanor issues. So I had the opportunity to read this book called Punishment Without Crime, How Our Massive Misdemeanor System Traps the Innocent and makes America more unequal. Excellent reading. I think everyone on the council and certainly anyone in your uh, department should read it. It just didn't find it analogous to the situation here. And so I want to explain that so people understand. First, our goal with the ordinance is safety, right? It's not as though this is a misdemeanor that is targeted at bad check writing or jaywalking or any number of examples used from this book. Um, and I think that's important because when we're targeting a weapon, not targeting people, I think that is the difference that this author even makes uh, uh, sure that is true about the arguments raised by this book. The second is really what is the purpose of punishment? And I'm glad that you mentioned Judge Hazlett Stevens because I think there are four purposes for punishment. There's retribution, deterrence, rehabilitation and incapacitation. And here we're talking about two of those, right? I think we're talking about deterrence and rehabilitation. So the idea that we're going to sort of entangle or ensnarl people into the criminal justice system and it will become a path for them that they can't escape, I think is, is um, hyperbole and not accurate because what we're trying to do is avoid the fear that comes from and the ramifications that come from this uh, thing that people are engaging here in, um, which is cracking whips at all hours of the day and night, scaring people, threatening people, getting in fights, fights with each other. Uh, those are all things I think are important. But it is important to me that there's an acknowledgement that we should not over-criminalize life, right? Misdemeanors can be, in some circumstances, very serious. And in misdemeanors can run the gamut. In different communities, it runs from everything from domestic violence and, and um, batteries, um, even sexual assaults in some communities are considered misdemeanors. So um, I want to make sure that people understand that, but that I do acknowledge that that is a concern. I also think it is, in fact, potentially the opposite. If we want to reduce 
people's interaction that they believe is negative uh, with law enforcement, then fewer calls for service is one of the ways to accomplish that, right? I think our men and women in the Reno Police Department are doing an incredible job of trying to balance a lot of competing concerns. And and as a result, again, I think that the focus has to be on what we're trying to regulate and also the acknowledgement that our misdemeanor system and our community court are very different than the ones highlighted by the book. Um, and so I, I, and I suppose the last thing I would add is that our system of community court is not motivated by profit. We're not trying to grab people, tag them with offenses in order to generate the revenue to, to support you know, a court system in that way. And so um, that's why ultimately this, although this book is awesome, and again, I encourage people to read it, it's not really analogous to what we've been dealing with. So I appreciate your presentation very much. And, and there's some a second round of conversation that I want to have, but I'll wait till my time. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Thank you. Councilwoman Breckis. Yeah. Wait, um, yes. Sorry, you can't see. Maybe I'll go like that. Oh, now I can <laughs> <laughs> now now I can see you. Um I'll go to Councilwoman Breckis and then I'll come to you. Sound good? That's good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. I um by way of introducing my, you know, thing thinking of this is I was not aware that this was an issue until about July 10th of this year. And I'm, I'm surprised, but I do not in any way discount particularly the residents' experience of the geography in which they reside, um, that it's been going on. But um, I live very close to downtown. I think I live as close to anyone on the council downtown. And I sleep with my windows open a lot. And I often wake up asking, you know, the person who sleeps with me, did you hear this or that at night? And I talk to neighbors. And um, so my first question, because it's been an issue I've been asking your chief for a long time, is where are we at on getting those shot count clocks, shot counters? Are you familiar with those, Lieutenant? Yes, ma'am. And um, we don't have any deployed yet, do we? I do not believe so. But I think, I think we're hoping to get some. So just from a decibel level, is there a distinct uh, quantitative difference between a whip use and a and gun caliber? I don't know if you could draw that conclusion because you're talk uh, if you're talking about calibers, you're talking about subsonic versus hypersonic rounds. Rifle rounds have uh, obviously a higher decibel because they're moving faster. Um, I would say, in my personal experience, um, being around gunfire as much as I have been and, and the training that we've had, I'm able to differentiate it. I don't know if my mom would be able to, um, a layman or somebody, a tourist. I don't know if they would be able to differentiate. Sure. And, you know, it may, it may be immaterial in that, um, you know, the calls are coming in. Correct. But when we get the shot clocks or counters, it may be that we can build a basis of, you know, this is that. And so... I just, I wanted to know about that. Um, when I saw that first video, and I think that's the one I saw on J July 11th, I was, um, I'd gone away and I had, you know, asked about how Barbara Bennett would be um, that park facility managed during the weeks that we opened the shelter, and someone showed me that video. I presume that those whip crackers were people who are maybe, um, and I, I don't like to presume who's homeless and who's not, because I don't think it's a very, it's oftentimes not a good um, street discernment someone can make. But I thought those were people who are maybe intimidating those people who are camped in Barbara Bennett at that point in time. But, um, but I've heard from the people for this ordinance and people with concerns for this ordinance that they understand the whip crackers to be people who are homeless. Is that like a universal given as we move forward with this? I wouldn't say it's a given. Um, like the, the stats indicated, the large majority of the uh, calls for service related to whips are in Central District, but they're also citywide. Um, we have whip calls from every district, every ward, every beat. Okay. I have one more question for you, but we have to go around and then I'll ask you my last question. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Councilwoman, do, um, no, Jarden, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here and giving us this information. Um, I can tell you as the representative for a big swath of downtown that this is an issue that we have 
uh, struggled with for some time, but you're correct in that it really has increased tremendously over the last 12 to uh, you know 18 months for sure. And I'm kind of tying that partly with COVID and people uh, wanting to be outside more. We're seeing more people gathering in our parks and I think it's um, more omnipresent of some of the activities that are occurring. And I'll just give an example and then I wanna ask about the possession versus the use to Councilwoman Dewar's comments because I'm trying to understand the way this is written and the reasons why. Um, in kind of hearing these calls and as a representative of the Downtown Reno Partnership, there is a lot of these complaints. And it's not solely from the residents who are hearing it late at night. It is a lot of those um, families that are trying to visit our parks and the riverfront. And I'll give you an example. When I walked the riverfront, it was last summer, down across from the Aces ball field and was walking along the river and there were, there were different people riding the bike path and going along and there were the whip crackers. And as I watched a father with his son on a bike go down the bike path, one of the whip crackers cracked the whip in the direction of the young boy. And he responded by wrecking his bike because it was such a shock you're, to hear this sound and then you see someone with a whip and it, it's that intimidation that seems to be the sole sort of driving factor. And, and I just have to say that image is burned in my mind of this impact to people trying to utilize a public space in a safe way and felt clearly very threatened and were scared by it. So I just thought I would give that. But my question is, what, why the possession versus the use? So what? the possession is important because you can, as you've seen from the videos, it's a moment in time that the whip is actually being utilized. Um, I like to equate it to other dangerous weapons that are listed in NRS, such as uh, brass knuckles. Uh, we don't wait to charge somebody with possession of brass knuckles till they put it on and get involved in a bar fight. Um, so the possession of the, the item uh, due to its nature of being deployed um, inherently makes it um, a dangerous circumstance to be carrying that around. Um, and then also with the, uh, the enforcement of it, we get, we get calls um, of whips um, in a general vicinity. You can imagine downtown um, with the echoes and, and the, the, the other street noises, um, trying to actually find somebody actively utilizing the whip um, when they can just crack it, put it away, and then keep walking, walk 10 feet, crack it again, um, would pose an issue with enforcement on that as well. So. Okay. That's why the possession. I, ha I have some more questions, but thank you. All right. I cannot tell who's up on the screen. If you have any more questions, raise your hand. Madam Mayor, I had one more question. Okay, go ahead. Councilwoman Brackus. Thank you. Um, so when you um, go to or have academy or other trainings and you learn defensive t tactics about different weapons, um, are whips often categorized in that law enforcement training as a weapon? Uh, in my academy, no. Um, I also went through almost 20 years ago um, yeah. when this wasn't really a big thing. Um, I can tell you um, if I was approached with somebody on the street cracking a whip, I would interpret that as if, as a threat towards, towards me as well. Yeah, in your professional. Okay. Yes. And I just, I'm trying to grasp you know, the problem, which I may be late to, and understand the approach um, of defining, because the ordinance would define it as a weapon. And, um, okay, well, thank you very much for um, that presentation. Yes, ma'am. All right, Councilman Doerr. Yeah, thank you. Um, just along the line, I was continuing, I appreciate the answer about the possession, because, you know, I don't think it's a crime to possess a gun. Um, I know you have to have it licensed, but let's say that it's a, you know, in a case on a wall. And I, I just don't know the nuances of, you know, when you have to get it, a, a permit or a license to even own versus just have. So it would be good to hear a little bit about that. Secondly, about the art, I really have to come back to this. I don't believe that artistic expression should interfere with people's quiet enjoyment of their property. Uh, you can look away from a mural. You don't want to see that mural, don't walk down that street. Uh, you don't want to see that sculpture, avoid it. But this whip cracking is, a, is an activity that is very, very hard to avoid. 
And again, I have personally experienced it. It is it's shocking. Um, adrenaline goes through your system. It creates a, a, a response in a human being. It feels threatening. It is very, very loud. And I think it's extremely inappropriate to have it on, again, not just city streets, but other property as well. I mean, if I, I, I understand that you could trespass and get people for that, but I think it should apply to all publicly owned property at a minimum. Um, and then finally, um, you know, I, I do think I'd like to hear a little bit more about the kind of the practice thing. I, if, if something's a sport, let's say karate, and you, you can't just go around the streets. Um, you can practice your moves as long as you're not interfering with somebody, but you can't practice them on somebody. You know, you can't go um, try your moves out on some unsuspecting person that's walking by. So I kind of liken it to a variety of these things. You know, it's like knives, guns, uh, you know, karate or any kind of other kind of um, uh, judo or any other kind of activity like that. So the issues of art, I, I'd like to see you guys really delve into that. The issues of um, use and what are some alternatives. Um, and then, hey, if there's stress, I get there's stress. What, what can we do to help people besides get them home, housed and provide them with services to relieve some of the stress if that's what it's about? So I'll stop right there. I'd like to hear some answers. Yes, ma'am. So I'll speak to the uh, possession of the gun. So if... Uh if I understand the question correctly, um, you're referring to like an antique gun on somebody's mantle right. or something like that. So obviously that's a, in a private residence. So somebody's possession of um, an antique um, whip in their own home um, wouldn't fall under this because this applies only to the public uh, public sphere there. Um, and then what was the, some of the other questions? Well, one of the other questions was about the, ex, um, the practice oh, of one's yes, heart. The practice. Um, so I would liken it to um, the fact that since it is a ranged um, weapon, a ranged tool, uh, meaning that it covers a, a quite a bit of a distance, as you can see, 20 feet sometimes, um, that would be the differentiation in my mind to the somebody who's practicing um, some jujitsu in a park with a partner. Um, that's much more close, uh, more less likely for a unwitting person who's riding their bike um, by to be involved in uh, being harmed by that. So that's where my concern would be. It'd be um, like I believe uh, one of the council members said, if someone was practicing um, knife throwing into a tree or something and somebody walked in between them and the tree, that would obviously... Well, that was, that was one of my points is just yeah. that, um, you know, I really think things are fine until you, and, and I'm sorry, it looks like I'm over, but until you start interfering with other people's quiet enjoyment of our city, that's where I think it crosses the line. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you so much. Officer Conley, just really quick, what is, um, what, what's an ordinance like for nunchucks? I guess I sort of equate it to that in a sense. So there is an ordinance, there's an R, uh, NRS for uh, nunchucks. Uh, it prevents uh, possession um, on school grounds only. So you can't possess nunchucks on school grounds. Um, NRS does cover some, uh, some unusual weapons that we wouldn't think of, um, such as um, saps. Um, if you think of the old school, like a leather sack with lead shot in it. Um, Dangerous, dangerous weapons, blackjacks, slung shots, billy, sand clubs, sandbags, and metal knuckles. So NRS does define um, various weapons other than the ones that we would commonly think of as dangerous weapons. Okay, thank you so much. I've actually had two incidences. One, I walked out of City Hall. I was speaking with a woman who had a dog and a, ba and a little girl and a baby, and all of a sudden we heard these loud popping noises. I thought for sure it was a gun. She thought it was a gun. Her dog went running, and then the little girl went running after the dog and almost got hit, literally right outside City Hall. It was, like, within probably three feet. Um, it, was, it was truly astonishing. And then another um, incident, and many of you know that I have a dear homeless friend named Asa who I often um, sort of scour the city looking for, and I, I found him. And he also said that it was incredibly alarming 
that, you know, he was hearing them all the time and, you know, he suffers from PTSD. And then I also think it's unfair that we say that this is, you know, something that the homeless are doing. I've, I've seen people that are not homeless doing this, but I got to tell you, I think it's intimidating. I think it's um, absolutely dangerous. Um, I, it, this is no way an art form. I'm sorry um, when you're, you know, putting things together with chains and other things that can hurt other people. But the sound is what's particularly alarming. And how do you know that someone else might also think that that's not a gunshot and pull out their gun and then create other situations. So I think this goes much bigger than we're sort of thinking this is just, you know, some way to alleviate stress or things of that nature. I honestly, I mean, I, I was, I was so terrified whenever I saw this and it, it is an absolute form of intimidation and I find it incredibly offensive. So anyway, thank you so much. I appreciate your, your information and your knowledge. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, uh, Council Councilman Delgado. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And, and, and a lot of my colleagues have my question. I just needed a little bit more clarity with respect to possession, possession and use. Um, and so, somewhat, somewhat new to me. But I guess a question would be: Is a person purchased a whip somewhere and they carried it from A to B? Um, they're houseless they could potentially be pulled over and ticketed. Is that what this is suggesting? Correct. If the mere possession in public. Per, okay. Yes, Just one clarity. If somebody had a gun on them and they were houseless, would they also be ticketed? In, as long as it wasn't concealed, no. As long as it wasn't concealed. Yeah. If it was a concealed weapon, then they would need a, the permit for concealed okay. firearm. So someone can carry and not be cited with a misdemeanor with a gun, but they can with a whip. Correct. Okay. Um, I understand the whole piece of the usage piece because I totally understand where the, my colleagues are coming from because I can only imagine, you know, the loud noises and everything else, going to a park, wanting to use a park, and then not really wanting to. If I see somebody out there swinging a whip, the loud noises, um, that, that interfere with the public space for, for me. But I'm just trying to think everything else in terms of how this connected with a whip and being transported and there not being some form or another of I'm not saying we do this but a, a thought or imagination that there may be some association with some kind of profiling or anything else going on right how do we get through that in terms of the possession versus the use let me walk through that a little bit more. yeah i would hope in that case and for the training with the officers that officer discretion I think at that point would be paramount if somebody buys a cattle whip from um, you know a feedlot store and they're taking it home I would hope that the officers would would utilize their discretion for that misdemeanor and understand that that wasn't the intent and the purpose of of this ordinance so I'm a little uncomfortable with that piece um, uh, in terms of us coming back with maybe working on some other kinds of definitions as to how that can play out. Um, the other one would be, um, no, that's that's my questions for now. I, I think uh, you guys see my, maybe my caution or somewhat uncomfortableness with kind of the broadness of what's being presented today. Yes, sir. Madam All Mayor, right, Councilman uh, Reese. Thank you. I, I guess I want to confine my uh, comments to the ordinance itself and, and say a couple of things to my colleagues. One is that, of course, the ordinance applies only on public grounds. Is that correct? Correct. So it's not that someone goes to Big Five and buys a Halloween costume to be Indiana Jones and they're walking to their car and all of a sudden you grab them, right? It's about where that's being used correct? Correct. And where it's being possessed. So um, that's certainly something that I think is important to understand. The second thing I suppose is that um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think uh, Ms. Wellborn talked about time, place, and manner restrictions and whether or not the exception for permitting is somehow uh, a fault of the ordinance as well. Obviously we received uh, public comment from, I don't know, somebody who is a whip master and is 
carrying on the cowboy traditions of whipping and wrote a book, right? And, and sort of was bemoaning the idea that if he wanted to come to Reno and put on a show, or I suppose Burning Man folks, they get out there with fire and whips and different things. Those are all permitted, right? And so that the exception is to allow, if there is an artistic element of it, not in the creation of the whip, because I'm not sure that that's ultimately it, but in the display of the prowess, right? That could be something for which a person could be permitted to do. Correct. Yeah, I look at that a lot. Like like you mentioned, the, the fire twirlers where RFD sets certain parameters for safety of people have to be a certain distance away and have to have certain permits and stuff like that. So Yeah, we've had controlled burn downtown yes. on the plaza and different streets and all that. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, okay, I think I've had the questions I have answered, uh, have been answered. I thank you for your time today. Thank you. All right. I believe Councilman Breckis. I think we're ready for uh, the city attorney's office now to do their okay. share of the presentation. Okay. Go right ahead, Mr. Sudi. If you want to. So writing an ordinance that's a, that carries criminal um, impact is, is challenging, and it does take a little bit of a legal art to do. You do have to balance a lot, a many different um, interests as well as someone's constitutional rights. So when RPD tasked this topic, the first thing I always like to do is look at what other areas across our country do. And what, what is interesting is, is that if you start on the East Coast, most states have a whip defined as weapon within their dangerous weapon laws and it's outright banned across the state. And then as you move towards the West, I think you see the impact of, of our country and how it developed and where cattle was raised, where horses were done. Those areas, as you further move West, it's no longer more of a state law. They become more county and city uh, ordinances of banning whips versus the states. Um, and so it's interesting to look at Nevada. I mean, this was definitely a cowboy state, cowboy land. And whips were used. They were used for cattle. They were used for, for horses, mainly, and ra ranchers. And you start seeing that impact on our state law where, yes, you can't possess a brass knuckle. You can't possess um, some of these other weapons uh, that, that Lieutenant Conley ha has mentioned outright, but whips weren't, weren't listed there. And then you start seeing out west different areas in the, on the West Coast with uh, county ordinances and city ordinances. And the most recent one I could find happened out of Hawaii. And that's why I, I put Hawaii up there, just so council is aware. This was the most recent version of a whip ordinance that was imposed. And when you look at what was going on in Hawaii, it was very similar to the very complaints the citizens in Reno are complaining about. And they needed something to address it. Hawaii law did not have a whip defined as a state law as a, as a weapon. And they went in and they made a very distinction and added it to, and I included it in your material, there are a huge list of, of dangerous weapons and, and you can find in there where they eventually get to, to the whip portion of it. Um, additionally, with some of the questions that council has asked, uh, I'll begin with permitted. Um, Burning Man is very famous up here. Um, we have events before and after. We do have a lot of burners that live in, in our area and they are performers and we do have a few that use whips in their performance. And when I did reach out to some of those organizations, uh, I, I did make contact with one individual who indicated that their events are always permitted by special events. And so if you look, I don't believe Hawaii has anything that said permitted. Um, they kind of probably don't have Burning Man events in, in their area, whereas we do. So. I tried to draw a distinction from what Hawaii had to what we may encounter locally, and those are those type of artistic events. Additionally, um, this law would not apply to private property, and what someone does in their own, on their own land is, is their business. And so you could uh, have a, a store or a, a, a training center set up to teach people how to use whips, and they'd be able to do it. And I'm going to tie that into the possession. When we look at firearms, we have very distinct laws that says you can't have a concealed weapon. 
Um, and that, that's obviously safety, and a lot of it has to do for officer safety as well, but we have a permit that allows you to do it. This is just the reverse. Someone goes to um, the feed store to get a whip and they put it in their car, it's not being displayed in public. An officer driving down the street is not going to see a person carrying the whip. And this was one of the things that was challenging to kind of overcome was the main problem for RPD and the citizen complaints. The complaints are whips, gunshots, RPD arrives. The citizen, either one, will not cooperate, as you, as you can imagine, some of the, the reports that you've heard already. And some of them are long gone by the time the police arrive. And what the police are stuck with is an individual who has a whip on them, who's standing in the middle of, of a sidewalk, street, walking on the, in the middle of the crosswalk on Virginia, who no longer is whipping the whip. Um, there was conversations about disturbing the peace, but you need a complainant to, to have that. You need a citizen to sign a complaint and face and go to court on that. Um, you cannot disturb a peace of a peace officer. That's case law. Additionally, um, we have the, the other issue, which, which kind of goes hand in hand with that, is if it's not visible, the police officer isn't going to stop you, right? So this is the reverse of the concealed. If you have it in a shopping bag, officer isn't going to stop you for that. So I was trying to balance someone who would actually possess a whip, maybe traveling to a, a, a class, a whip class, and they wouldn't be stopped because it's not on their possession. When police arrive, no one's around, no one's to make a complaint, and they're stuck here. They're stuck with this individual who is in the middle of the park by themselves with a whip. They were obviously recently cracking, cracking it, and there's no one around to make the complaint. A misdemeanor offense has to occur in the presence of an officer. And this is where, again, if you saw the earlier video, that RPD was standing right there when that guy was cracking the whip. He was right next to the police car. So the knowledge is that there is no law out there to prevent this from happening. And if you don't encounter some language to address the possession, it, I would equate it to like a nuisance. Um, you know, someone's going to call says, oh, there's a nuisance. Someone's cracking whips out inside my window. By the time the police arrive, our code allows for the nuisance to be abated before it's enforced. Well, as soon as the police arrive, the nuisance is abated. They're no longer going to crack the whip in front of, from a police officer. And then once again, we, I think we'd be back here again addressing public concern of police are not doing their job. They are not addressing this problem. So the, it, trying to put that in language, I think this was the best balancing act I could, I could come up with. I like drawing Hawaii's law. Hawaii is from the Ninth Circuit. It's the most recent law. It has not been challenged in now three years. Um, other places in California, Oregon, Washington, Arizona. Um, Arizona has a state law on it. So when you, when you look at some of the states and localities, I always try to draw that distinction and bring it as close to the Ninth Circuit as I can because if we were ever challenged on our ordinances, that's where we will end up anyways. And so that's kind of the historical quick, short, long version of how we got to, to, to this definition. Once again, public grounds, um, it was really to target sidewalks and the parks um, and some of the other areas that we have like along the Truckee River. Um, the, the walking path is not a park, it's just a pathway. And so how do you encounter and grasp that? And that public grounds uh, definition was there as well. So if I'll address any questions anyone may have. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to go to Councilwoman Jarden. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, I did put my speaker hand up, I think. Um, so, my, so my question is this, um, and I do think we're trying to find that distinction between, you know, the person heading to the rodeo grounds uh, uh, or the person who is uh, intimidating and, and potentially harming uh, in a public space. Um, so, so the question I have is, in the, in the complaints that RPD has to date, is it 15 people cracking whips? And we're, and, uh, or is it three people who are, you know, is it 80%, 20% causing 80% of the, you know, that sort of thing? I'm trying to understand how broad the individual use of the whips is versus a few individuals doing it a lot. Uh, I don't know if I could could answer that because a lot of the complaints we get are just general, I live here, 
on this day and time I heard I heard whips cracking. Um, I can tell you that there's there's more out there than than you would think in my my work along the river. Um, it's it's a lot more common than you would you would think. Um, I can't give you a percentage, but um, there's not just one person out there doing it. Um, it may have started that way three, four years ago, and I think uh, you know the Reno Whitman kind of became a, an internet um, social media thing. Um, but now it's it's full grown. Um, it's well known that these are out there and how to make them and and that kind of thing. So I don't think it's limited to five or six people. I think it's a lot more widespread than we can even uh, assume. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you. Um, that's that's helpful. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is Council Member Breckis. Um, you know, I appreciate, Mr. Sudi, your explanation because um, I did not pick up that there is precedent in other jurisdictions for whip bans as a weapon um, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I haven't done a lot of public safety laws but Hawaii usually isn't used as an example but the la rationale that they're in the Ninth Circuit I can see from your perspective that's important um, and they're not used as an example also often because they have very different laws they're you know they're set up government differently they're culturally different but I would imagine that the um, WHIP definitions are not so much, are more related to tra history of transportation because their transportation systems to the east developed with more horse and buggy, whereas we, you know, we're not as, we, we grew up in later periods with the other modes. That's just maybe my, my thinking of the transportation history. But, um, you know, we, I, I've, I've wondered if there were other approaches on this and we want to give the, the, the law enforcement the tools they need, they feel they need, but I'm also concerned that we could be getting challenged, but it gives me comfort that the Hawaii one is, is good. And we have RMC 612050 about horse-drawn vehicles, so, <laughs> so we contemplate in some way people using horses, which then, you know, would be about, you know, I, I don't know, driving, you know, with whips. But, and, and, and also after July 10th, I did see an individual using whip on a sidewalk and that was in my view a sidewalk use that was extreme in terms of the space that person demands on the sidewalk and that's a very neutral approach. It's not a weapon, it's not intimidation, it's just how much sidewalk you think at any moment you, your personage as it carries through is going to demand and I would liken it to sometimes you see people with these long leash runs on the dogs. I know they're very popular and maybe they work well, but sometimes they're also taking up more space on a sidewalk than one ought to. So I was wondering if you could craft sidewalk use in a certain way and maybe along the way Ms. Stewart said is if, you, if it's too extreme to go to call it a weapon, and I haven't heard it, you know, maybe it's fine, is that a whip in any public space, as you say, has to be in a carrying case at all times. So there you see it out, and it doesn't matter what it is. You know, it could be my, you know, my, my blankie, my binky, but it it's, needs to be in a case, and we have a public purpose behind that. And then I was also wondering if there's the argument that, a lot of, that some people are using that this is my recreation, maybe we could look into that as a recreation use at some park somewhere and have the park commission think about it because I I do know that people do Tai Chi in the park they do other you know slack lining they do other uses in the park where they take up space and they maybe have martial arts in origin so I was wondering if Thank maybe you, we could do Breckis. here but not there sort of thing did you think of any of these kind of ways Thank You Councilwoman Breckis Thank You Miss um, Presiding Officer so the the language of permitted um, is encountering a lot of that uh, the the artistic use and and that would allow if if parks wanted to set aside a specific part with a specific area that allows whips they could because that would be permitted um, so that I left that permitted kind of vague in the sense that it gave a lot of discretion 
on how, how it could be permitted. And so, yes, the city of Reno could determine certain areas of the city as an appropriate area where whips, whips are used and whips, you know, there'll be an expectation that you're going to hear the cracks of the whips because that's an that's a area that's okayed. And then also, obviously, to address special events in, 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 the, in you know, our town and so forth. If, if there was a performer that had whips involved, they could, they could do that. Um, and then also, like, the rodeo and so forth. Um, I think that was... What about the sidewalk you. and the Thank leash? Thank you. We'll, we'll move on to the end. We'll come back around if we should do so. Uh, Council Member Dewar? Yes. Thank you. Um, first comment is that, you know, one of my colleagues said that it's not the, the scene, that's the art, but the use, but I, I do beg to disagree. I've gone to cowboy poetry over in Elko many, many times, and whips are displayed. It is considered, you know, an artistic form to create an interesting whip. So I totally get that. Also, um, there are cowboys and cowgirls in Hawaii. I mean, they, they are out in almost most states. So I understand where that came from. My big questions are about this, the enforcement. So maybe it's a case, I'd like to better understand if it becomes a felony, is there a warning option? You know, I could see kind of a three strikes you're out. You're, you're warned, you're warned again, and the third time you, you know, are cited, um, you know, in terms of the enforcement. Is that a possibility as a felony or does it have to be something else? And another question is about the permits. Like, who would be given these permits? Would they get it from the police, uh, you know, from our police officers? Would they get it from our events people? I mean, what's conceived of here, Mr. C.D.? So, so the permit is something that would probably stem all the way from a, for example, department like the Parks Department could declare an area that's permitted. Um, so it would be areas that are permitted, not necessarily a, a permit. Person? Uh, okay. It, yes. And then also, that would also fall in the hands of, you know, as mentioned earlier, special events. Special events permit all across the, our city. So they could grant an event, you know, that would be on City Plaza. And it would be a whip event. And that would be okay. So there's different formats of, of I, I would try to move away from the term permit like the actual document versus, you know, a department saying, like parks, this, this you know, old unused tennis court can now be used as the whip area. Um, it, you can kind of brainstorm from there. Additionally, uh, the, what was the enforcement. second? Enforcement. Oh, enforcement. Um, so. The three strikes. The three strikes. Okay, so it would never be a felony unless our Nevada legislature decides to tackle that issue. Um, so it's a, it, it would be a misdemeanor. Uh, okay. Simple enough, I, we can easily write in um, that a warning must be given prior to enforcement. We have other misdemeanor laws in our code that do require law enforcement to issue a warning. Um, I don't like to, to box officers in. Sometimes a warning might last, be one warning that can be a minute because of the urgency to a day, 24 hours, 48 hours, and so forth. So I like to leave officer discretion on that, on that part, but easily could insert a requirement of a warning first before enforcement. Yeah, I would like something like that because it would be difficult to just have sort of this one strike you're out. So it doesn't have to be three strikes, but I would like to see some kind of, first of all, education, as our officer alluded to, and then number two would be you, some kind of potential warning. Council Member Dewar, I'm sorry, I need to move on. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, let me understand, is their answering part of, I can't, you know, we're not focused on the screen. Is their answering uh, part of it? They did answer, point? and now you're responding to their answer. So I need to move on um, to Council Member Delgado. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, a lot of my colleagues asked my questions. Thank you, Sue, Sue for, for your part of the, the section. I think that clarified quite a bit for me. Um, and I appreciate the Ninth Circuit uh, piece to that as, as that's probably where if something were to be challenged, that's what you guys are going to have to go back and, and take care of utilizing some of that language. Um, I guess maybe the bigger part for me is, is what you're starting to, to start alluding to is the time frames in terms of how the community in general is going to be educated and informed as to when this is going to take place. 
I know the officer had said two weeks. Um, I don't know if that's, I don't know typically what you guys usually do when you push out a new ordinance or a new law or something that's going to create a misdemeanor of sorts and, and how much information that should require. I think two weeks probably isn't as maybe pretty short in terms of how getting, but I could understand uh, get in front of some of the, the, the potential actors that are, it sounds like there's a handful of them, but not the general community. So can you talk to me a little bit more to your typical rollout versus something what you guys see here? So, so normally it's, it's the discretion of the chief uh, once an ordinance is passed. Uh, we've seen such things as traffic. I, I believe you guys uh, recently passed the uh, pedestrian safety zones where RPD did do a traffic enforcement of only warnings. That was a two-week period. Uh, but it could extend up to 30 days. I mean, it's discretion of, of the chief and probably the will of the council that would dictate how long the education piece would occur before actual anybody would ever be charged. So it'd be a two-week warning for if you saw me out there cracking the whip, you'd say <laughs> you'd give me two weeks to kind of comply, warning after warning after warning kind of deal, versus maybe me as an individual saying you get three warnings because that might be pretty hard to do in terms of gathering the data and everything else. Uh, or someone keeping track of that? Yeah, so typically the warning would be I contact you, let you know, hey, this ordinance just passed yesterday. Yeah. Um, here's the ordinance explained to you. Um, starting this date, whatever date uh, the chief um, and council work out, we're going to start enforcing at this level as a misdemeanor. Um, so same thing with the pedestrian safety zones. If we pulled someone over to, in that pedestrian safety zone, they were given a warning, just like a regular traffic stop, hey, there's a new pedestrian safety zone, here's the regulations, here's how it works, here's when enforcement's going to take, uh, take effect. Do you guys go out and notify businesses that may sell this or anything else or interested parties, this is going to happen and... That would all that would all occur during the okay. educational period time um, to address the the council's overall concern about um, possession. Um, I, I'm in favor of putting into the law a warning mechanism trigger for police when they encounter this to obviously issue a one-time warning before they would actually you know to enforce it, and that would obviously put someone on notice if they just had it in possession and didn't know, they would be informed they, they got to put it away. And if they refuse at that point, that will be officer discretion to enforce. So that probably would overcome some of the uh, council's c concerns with the term possession, um, which is simple enough we can bring back on a, on a first read if, if you elect to go for it. And I see Deputy Chief here, so I'll... Thank you, Mr. Sudi. Uh, Deputy Chief Ollie Miller for the record. And I just wanted to kind of expand a little bit on uh, or comment to Council Member Delgado's question about the enforcement piece and how important that education piece is to our community. And that is uh, your police department getting in front of social media, going out and meeting with members of our community, business owners, uh, those who reside in the downtown core to update them on this law should it be passed. And uh, I know that this is extremely important to Chief Soho, Soto who wanted to be here today, but ex expanding that educational period to more than the two weeks, maybe a month, or depending upon if and when this is passed, maybe January 1st uh, as a date, and then relying heavily on that officer discretion piece ensuring that we aren't stopping those individuals who are either housed or unhoused, uh, who just made their purchase of a whip at uh, the feed store while they're going back to their home or tent or wherever. You know, that's not the intent of this. So uh, the community education piece is extremely important. I just wanted to speak to that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I need to move on. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Delgado. Uh, Council Member Breckis. Yeah, I mean, the database to me, or the, the warning has concerns to me, Mr. Sudi, because then you've got a list, a database somewhere as first time warnings people somewhere in some administrative spot. That, that wouldn't create a database. I, I am talking on the, on the, field for officers. We have a lot of misdemeanor charges in our code already that, you know, uh, for example, camping along the river requires a warning. Sitting lying on a sidewalk requires a warning. So those are warnings that are given by officer. 
to inform the person they're in violation of the law and then obviously to correct that behavior. And then they're given a time and that time is a discretion and then either enforcement occurs in, within minutes to days later that there's no database that, you know, uh, John Doe was given a warning, you know, August 1st and we encountered him now in October. That, that it wouldn't work that way. Basically every time they would encounter John Doe, they would give a warning and oh, well, make sure that, you know. Okay. I have to cut you off because of our time constraints, um, but I understand. So it's in that field moment. Um, Is this a what about idea? this idea, it, you know, you mentioned that a lot of states, it's the state that does that, and our state does it on brass knuckles. And believe me, I'm all about local control, but Nevada isn't that kind on it. And, um, you know, we would argue, I suppose, that we have the authority to make local control and define weapons, but it is a bit of an anomaly, and that's why I was probing, and I didn't get a chance to ask you, and I'll be more specific, is one, what about making it to sidewalk activity in this leash, you know, this taking up more space, and then two, um, not, you know, that you can have, if you have one, it has to be in a case, or in a, you know, something like that. So if they obviously show up, they don't see them cracking it, but they see them in their hand, you know, have you thought of those two? So in the lead, you know, taking up more space on a sidewalk or you got to carry it in some sort of covering. So the, the defining of a weapon as, as a whip as a weapon, there is precedent across the country. So I'm not too worried about us basically filling a gap that's left in the NRS. We have the authority to do so, and we have precedent in other states all across the country that has defined it. I think it's just the historical makeup of how the West became the West is why it wasn't originally put in there. Um, the, the distance, I think, becomes challenging. Um, that makes it very difficult for officers um, to, you know, when is a whip too long? When is a whip too short? And in that, I don't like laws like that. I think that ties the hands of the officers and puts them in very unique situations where, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine someone measuring a whip to say, okay, your whip was only three feet, you weren't taking off enough space. That is just too, too arbitrary, arbitrary for police officers to enforce, and I think that opens up them to liability. Whereas if you just say you can't crack it, no matter if it's a, you, you know, however long the whip is, if it fits the definition, you, you can't do that. And that, that's a much easier law to enforce. And additionally, I think it puts the community on notice. And, and that's a big thing is, is how is the community supposed to know that a three-foot whip is okay but not a ten-foot whip? And is it on the sidewalk? Is it a park? And I think you, you start carving out too much of enforcement for the community. And then the covering. Thank you, thank you so much. Council it, Member Breckis, thank you. Council Member Jarden. Thank you very much. And again, thank you all for your work on this. I know this has been, um, you guys have been working on this for some time and certainly has been something that um, has been a priority for the individuals that not only live downtown but want to have safe and equal access to our public spaces, to our parks, to our river walks. Um, and I appreciate the work done on this and, and, and the homework done to try to find the correct language. And, and again, I think this, you've got some great feedback here today on the way in which we can maybe thread this to make sure we're um, doing everything within the letter of the law and we're not targeting anybody, but we're also recognizing an issue that is growing in our community and one in which we want to address in the safest and most effective way. So, um, Madam Mayor, I was buttoning up to prepare for a motion if you were ready for it, but I see Council Member Reese is up, so I'll let him if he wants to. Thank you. I was trying to figure out how I was going to get my Devo references in, but <laughs> I, I'm not sure anyone would appreciate it, the lateness of the hour. I suppose for my part, uh, Mr. Sudi, and to our uh, police folks who are here today with us, you know, every law that we have uh, has discretion involved in it, and that is a question of training and officer experience. So I'm going to leave that to your better judgment and discretion as we move forward. Obviously, that's part of that's training and part of that is experience, but we were not trying to um, hurt persons who believe that this is something that they need in their life. What we're doing is trying to balance the competing needs of a larger community. And you've, we, I mean, we've had, I don't know, 50 or 60 or 100 comments today uh, registered that were about 
people's enjoyment of their homes, their parks, their streets, which were being impacted negatively by someone else's behavior. And so, um, and some of those were scary. I mean, some of them involved people falling off bikes, children running in the streets. I, I mean, all of those things being the case, those are just our anecdotal evidence about a thing. So I'm hopeful that we can um, go with the ordinance as you've designed it and represented it to be. I don't think it needs to include, for my purposes, a written into it a warning. I, again, our officers are trained. They they know how to give a warning. They how to, They know how to spot someone who is buying it as a costume for an Indiana Jones, you know, Halloween party. I, I just think we just have to have apply some common sense to what we're talking about. What we're trying to target is the use of it as a weapon, a form of intimidation, not, you know, someone who is also, uh, I, I, I suppose some of them are artistic in their creation, meaning they're beautifully braided and they've got handles with jewels in them or whatever it is. That's not what we're talking about here today. We're talking about them being used as a form of intimidation, as a, a weapon, as something that is out of the norm for our community standards. And so uh, I'm thankful that we've had the conversation. Um, you know, that's it. No, no Devo references. <laughs> All right. Any other questions from council? I don't see anyone's hand up, so I'm going to send it to you, Councilwoman Jardin, and I want to say thank you um, because I know that you have been following this closely and you have had a lot of the complaints come in to your ward and directly at you. I've been CC'd on some of those emails, so thank you. I, I really appreciate you, so go ahead. Thank you very much. At this time, I would make a motion to move forward with staff recommendation on the creation of this new ordinance. I'm going to second do work. All right, I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? One minute. Seeing that there, I have just one quick question for as they're coming back, I, they'll have to come back, I think, with a proposed first reading. So, my only question is just how do you want to address use on other public property, whether it's NDOT, RTC, flood project lands, all of these lands that are not City of Reno, but they're within the bounds of City of Reno? Maybe think about that when before you bring back the ordinance, the final proposed ordinance. Thank you, Councilwoman right. Dewar. I agree with that. I think that's important. The last thing we want to do, and we've seen this happen, where we impose an ordinance in one area and it squeezes the activity or the behavior into another. We want to avoid that. So however we best incorporate this to uh, best keep that from happening, I will incorporate that in my motion. Okay, great, thank you. All right, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you so much. Sending it back to you and great job, Officer Conley and Mr. Sudi. Great to see you too.